Well, let us turn back to that passage that we read together in Isaiah chapter 30. And we're just considering uh, the portion that we read in verses 1 to 17. Isaiah chapter 30 and uh, verses 1 to 17. And I've entitled the message uh, this morning, sort of a strange sounding title, but it is Wanting a Quick Solution. Wanting a Quick Solution. Strange sounding title for a sermon. Uh, But I believe this really does speak to the passage or describe the passage before us uh, this morning. We live particularly at this time, in a time when everyone wants the solution to the current crisis and as quickly as possible. In fact, I was going to uh, entitle the message, Wanting a Quick Fix, but I thought uh, that sounded a bit too uh, uh, strange. So, But the same idea. We are impatient. We don't want this time uh, to last And the people of Israel, at the time in which we have read, they wanted a quick solution to the threat from their enemy, from Assyria, the ones that they originally had trusted in, but now their trust was moving as a consequence of the present threat from them. Now their help was turning from Assyria to Egypt. They did not want to wait upon the Lord, so they went to Egypt for help, wanting a quick solution, wanting to see with their eyes what their faith and trust would be in. And we notice four things in this passage, and we're outlining it with these headings. First of all, a shameful trust. Second, a suitable description. Thirdly, a sentence pronounced. And fourthly, a salvation rejected. So first of all, a shameful trust in verses 1 to 7. And we see two main things in these verses. We see the reason and the result of the shame. Notice first of all the reason of the shame in verses 1 and 2. It says in verse 1, Woe to the rebellious children. And therefore, this trust is shameful for the following reasons. First of all, it is rebellious. It is an act of rebellion to trust in anything or anyone apart from God. But notice who they are rebelling against. They are rebelling as children against a father. Woe to the rebellious children. But not only that, they are rebelling as the children of God against God himself, who is their father in heaven. So to rebel against a parent or the authorities is shameful, at least when the parents and the authorities are requiring that which is just, that is shameful. But to rebel against God is much more so. One of the problems that we have at this moment in uh, the history of the world is how to relate to the authorities and so on. Once the authorities are requiring that which is legitimate, we are responsible to follow them. Rebellion is described in 1 Samuel 15 as the sin of witchcraft. So this is a serious sin. This rebellion against God is serious. But secondly, it is shameful because foolish. Not only because it is wrong in itself, but it's even wrong pragmatically, if we can put it that way. That take counsel but not of me. They're looking to wisdom from something that is not God, from those who do not know what God knows and who do not have the wisdom that God has. 
thirdly, shameful because reckless, and that cover with a covering, but not of my spirit. Here they had the opportunity and the advantage as the people of God to cover with the very um, spirit of God and the covering that he would provide. But instead, in their reckless actions, and I use that word very clearly, this is reckless. It is foolhardy to trust in anybody else rather than God. Fourthly, it is shameful because of a multiplication of sin. When we trust in anything else apart from God, we will inevitably add sin to sin. Fifthly, shameful because of a trust in Egypt. And this is especially shameful because it's Egypt. Egypt in scripture represents the world and all that the world represents. That walk to go down into Egypt and have not asked at my mouth to strengthen themselves in the strength of Pharaoh and to trust in the shadow of Egypt. Now, as we have already said, to trust in anything apart from God is shameful, but the people were specifically told not to trust in Egypt. So Deuteronomy 17 and verse 16. But he shall not, speaking of the future king of Israel, he shall not multiply horses to himself, nor cause the people to return to Egypt, specifically not to return to Egypt, to the end that he should multiply horses, again, with the emphasis of not trusting in the strength of Egypt. For as much as the Lord hath said unto you, he shall henceforth return no more. That way they were to leave Egypt and they were not to return. But now they are in great shame and great rebellion and great reckless foolishness because they are returning to the very nation for the very reason that they are told not to return to that nation. Shame indeed. Consider in our text how Egypt is described. It is described as the shadow. It is trusting in the shadow of Egypt. And then we see in verses 3 to 7 the result of the shame. First of all, hope would be turned to confusion. Note the words in verse 3. Therefore shall the strength of Pharaoh be your shame. And the trust in the shadow of Egypt your confusion. There was expectation. There was hope. There was a reliance and a hopeful reliance upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt. But it would be turned to shame and to confusion. Psalm 118 reminds us it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Hope would be turned to confusion. Secondly, the great effort in seeking this help from Egypt. Look at verse 4. For his princes were at Zoan and his ambassadors came to Haines. In other words, they went this far, and the princes of Judah went as far as Zoan and to Haines. The only time, by the way, that this uh, second place is mentioned in all of Scripture, we're not exactly sure where it is, but the emphasis seems to be that the leaders of Judah went all the way to these places in order to seek help. They traveled far into Egypt for help. In contrast, Calvin notes, quote, They did not need to go far to seek God. They did not need to endure much toil or spend large sums of money in calling on him. They could have done so from their very dwelling place. Great effort. And this speaks to us, doesn't it, of, of false religion, because with false religion, it takes great effort. 
It demands great effort of man. Whereas the Lord Jesus says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. But by nature, we tend to reject the easy way of God for the hard and torturous way of all that is false. Thirdly, not only could Egypt not help, but actually damage them. We see in verse 5, they were all ashamed of a people that could not profit them. All their hopes are dashed. Nor be in help nor profit, but actually bring shame and also a reproach. So the situation gets actually worse. False religion not only will not help us, but will actually condemn us and make the situation much worse for us. This is what it is to trust in the world, not help, but harm. Fourthly, the shame of a reversal of the Exodus. Look at verse 6. Instead of bringing riches out of Egypt like they did in, in Exodus 12, verses 35 and 36, where we read, The children of Israel did according to the word of Moses, and they borrowed of the Egyptians jewels of silver, of gold and raiment. And the Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they lent unto them such things as they required, and they spoiled the Egyptians. Now we see the complete opposite of that. Now in verse 6, the burden of beasts of the south into the land of trouble and anguish from whence came the young and the old lion, the viper and the fiery flying serpent. They will carry their riches. Look what's happening in verse 6. Now they're carrying the riches from uh, Israel upon the shoulders of young asses and their treasures upon the bunches of camels to a people that shall not profit them. What a reversal. What a turnaround. And we see that this is a result of, instead of in Exodus 12, uh, doing the word of the Lord through Moses, now they are ignoring God's word through Isaiah, and now they are doing their own will. The shame of a reversal of the Exodus. And then fifthly, their help will be worthless. Their help will be worthless. Verse 7, for the Egyptians shall help. It seems that they try and help. It seems that there's an attempt of help, but it's empty. It's, it's vain and it's no purpose. It, it does nothing of any value. In great contrast comes the call of verse 7. Therefore have I cried concerning this. Their strength is what? To sit still. The strength of God's people is to sit still. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 46 verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. The Lord of hosts is with us. Verse 11 of Psalm 46. The God of Jacob is. We don't have to go anywhere. God is with us. God is our refuge and strength. God is our, is our present help. He, he's here. We don't have to, to go anywhere else. God is with us. We just have to trust in his word. As the Reverend David Silverside said in preaching on this text, their best thing to do is to do nothing. Their best thing to do is to do nothing. You see, human religion is a do, do, do. It's dependence upon effort, whereas the, the faith of Scripture is to rest in the promises of a covenant-keeping God. And then our second heading, and we'll be briefer with the remaining headings. We spend most of our time in the first one. Briefly now with these other three headings. Second, a suitable description in verses 8 to 11. A suitable description of the people of Judah. Notice, firstly, it is a recorded description in verse 8. It's to be written in a table, noted in a book. In fact, we have it still. Why? That it may be for the time to come forever and ever. 
Notice it's to be written in their presence. It's to be written so that they know it's there. It's a testimony against them. Write it before them. Preach it before them. Write it before them so that it might become a testimony against them. It's a recorded description. Secondly, it's of a rebellious people. Verses 9 to 11. And three things in verses 9 to 11. Three relationships. Three dreadfully rejected relationships. A relationship to the word of God is rejected. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. But even though they will not hear it, it is to be preached. It is to be written down. It is to be a witness against them, even though they reject my word. Not only will they reject my word, they will reject my prophets. Verse 10, which say to the seers, See not unto the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, speak unto us smooth things, prophesy deceits. You see the deceitfulness here of this statement. They're saying to the prophets, we'll accept you if you preach what we like. We'll accept you if you say what we think is right. And how many have so-called preachers bought into this deception, saying what the people want to hear rather than what they need to hear. We need to preach what the people need, not what the people want. A bit like a doctor, uh, not saying just what the patient wants to hear, but saying the truth and giving the diagnosis and the prognosis and all the plans to uh, put things in action to bring healing. Not to tickle the ear, but to help the person. As preachers, we are to preach the truth. The truth is always to be our purpose. But then, not only did they reject the word of God and the prophets of God, they rejected God himself. Their rebellion was complete against his word, against his preachers, and against himself, verse 11. They say, as they're not saying these words, but this is God's interpretation. This is how God interprets what they are saying. Get you out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us again they wouldn't have said those exact words but that is what in effect they were saying and that's god's interpretation of their hearts so we've considered a shameful trust a suitable description and now thirdly a sentence pronounced it is a sentence pronounced against this people notice in verse 12 the reason of the pronouncement. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word, and trust in oppression and perverseness, and stay thereon, resting in these things, trusting in perverseness, rather than trusting in my word, rather than trusting in holiness, rather than trusting in the Holy One of Israel, You are trusting in perverseness. You are using perversion and oppression as the very thing that you rest on and rest in. Then we see the sentence itself in verses 13 and 14 in the form of an image. Verse 13, therefore this iniquity shall be to you as a breach ready to fall. The idea here is of a, of a, of a swelling in a high wall, a very high wall. There's a breach in the wall and it's just ready to break. And then whose breaking cometh suddenly at an instant. They are unaware of it. They don't care about it. But God is saying this is going to happen and it will happen in a moment. In the form of an image, verse 13, but then in the form of a prophecy, verse 
14. Now, twice is the word he used uh, in this uh, verse, but uh, the com- all the commentators that I read agree that the he is by way of a figure rather than referring to a person. And he, or it shall break, the wall shall break, as the breaking of the potter's vessel that is broken in pieces, he shall not spare, or it shall not spare. The wall, the breaking of the wall will not spare. When this comes, there will be no sparing. There will be no redemption, so that there shall be not found in the bursting of it a share, a peace to take fire from the hearth or to take water with all out of the pit. E.J. Young notes here that fire and water are mentioned as opposites supplementing one another. Fire and water normally compete, but here they're actually working together against the people. There is fire against them. There is water against them. Everything is against them. And this will happen in a moment. This is what happens when we cease to trust in the Lord. And when we trust in the arm of the flesh. When we trust in Egypt. As it says in chapter 31. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help. And then lastly. We consider a salvation rejected. A salvation rejected. Notice, first of all, under this last heading, a wonderful and easy solution. A wonderful and easy salvation recommended and offered. And there's pregnant uh, ideas in, in this verse. In fact, we have at least seven ideas in this verse. Let me just give you, give you them as seven words, all beginning with or. We have a Redeemer. Just look at the verse yourself, verse 15. We have a Redeemer, a returning, a rest, a a redemption, a restfulness, a reassurance, and a resource. We could preach a sermon just on those, on that verse with those seven words. But here's a wonderful and in a sense easy, quote unquote, easy salvation. Easy for us, not easy for God because it necessitates the crucified Savior to die for us in order to that salvation. But for us, it is easy. It's wonderful. It's precious. And this is offered. This is the salvation by this wonderful Redeemer that if we return, we will find rest and redemption and restfulness and reassurance in His resource, in His strength. That's the verse. For thus saith the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest shall ye be saved, in quietness and in confidence shall be your strength. A wonderful salvation. A blessed salvation to our souls. But notice, it's rejected. In those four words at the end of verse 15, and ye would not. What a rejection. What a shameful, reprehensible rejection of God's salvation. Ye would not. The Lord Jesus said to the Jews in John 5 verse 40, And ye will not come to me, that ye might have life. Ye will not. Ye refuse. Verse 16 says, But ye said, No, for we will flee upon horses. We have a better idea. We have a better solution. This is too easy. This is, we don't trust this. You see, this is the bottom line, isn't it? They simply do not trust God. Because if they had trusted him, what would they have done? They would have responded. The vast majority of people do not believe that this is true. The vast majority of people in the world today have a better idea. No, 
we will flee upon horses. And those horses could represent any type of religion or any type of trust that is a rejection of God's salvation. Therefore shall ye flee, comes back the word. You will flee. You say you will flee, but you will flee in a different way than you think. And you say we will ride upon the swift. Therefore, verse 16, therefore, and this is the consequence of such a rejection, therefore shall they that pursue you be swift. One thousand shall flee at the rebuke of one. This is a reversal of another scripture which actually says that when we trust the Lord that we will send um, a multitude fleeing and we will have that great victory. Now the, the image is reversed so that 1,000 of you shall flee at the rebuke of one. At the rebuke of five shall ye flee till ye be left as a beacon upon the top of a mountain and as an ensign on and hill. They would literally become a beacon and a sign of what happens when we forsake confidence and faith in the Lord. They would represent, they would become a, a, a startling representation of what it is to reject the true God, to reject the salvation of God. Now the application as we close is clear. What am I going to represent? What am I going to represent? What is my life going to represent? Will my life represent what it is to reject God or what it is to trust God? That's what eternity is all about. That is heaven and hell. Heaven will be populated and it will show what it is. The people in heaven will be this everlasting beacon, this everlasting light of what it is to trust God. And all the people in hell will be an everlasting reminder and representation of what it is to reject God's salvation. That's a simple and as clear as it gets, isn't it? Psalm 125 says, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion. And what a contrast we have here, because it is said of the, uh, of the Israelites that they would be like a, a sign or a, an ensign or a beacon on a hill in that awful negative sense. But those who trust in the Lord shall be the mountain. They won't be a sign or a representation on a hill, they will be the mountain. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. There's the choice. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Choose whether you're going to be the sign on the hill or if you're going to be like that mountain. What a contrast. And may the Lord bless his word to our souls. Amen. Amen. Let us conclude with that psalm, Psalm 125. Psalm 125. Now after we sing this, we'll close in prayer and the benediction. Psalm 125. They and the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill which at no time can be removed, but standeth ever still. As round about Jerusalem the mountains stand alway, the Lord his folk doth compass so from henceforth and for aye. Psalm 125, singing the whole of the psalm. They in the Lord that firmly trust shall be like Zion Hill, which at no time can be removed, but standeth Jerusalem
Each one that has considered these words and will hear these words will choose to be those who will trust the Lord, to wait and to be strong and to trust in the Lord, and that they will choose to be like those mountains, like Mount Zion, and those who will have the Lord surrounding them with his strength. Lord, deliver us from the empty and vain choice to refuse God and to think that we know better and to trust in our own goodness, our own righteousness, our own works. What a travesty. What a shame. What rebellion. To trust in the rags of our self-righteousness, which are like stinking cloths to God. O Lord, enable us to trust rather in the white robe of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died for us, who was buried and who rose again, so that his people would have life everlasting. O Lord, we thank Thee for the man of sorrows, for the one who was rejected of men, but the one who has been established by God as the only way to glory, the only way to peace and to everlasting joy. O Lord, fill Thy people this day with thy blessed and Holy Spirit. Forgive us for all our sins and enable us and impart true faith to our souls. Grant us a resting and a trusting and a confidence in the Lord God of heaven and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ.
now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Saviour, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen.